Hi and welcome to a new video. Today we will take a closer look at the new Threadripper 3960X. I'm a little bit late to the party because I had to buy a retail CPU first um, to be able to perform this test. It's this one on the table right here. I also got a TRX 40 hours extreme board from Gigabyte with a CPU sample that I have to return. Um, but for the test today I used the values of the retail sample so you can be sure that all the values you see in today's test kind of reflect a real uh, retail CPU. And I know that the title of this video is a little bit um, difficult, let's say like that, because this is the Threadripper 2990WX, the 32 core second generation AMD Threadripper which I personally often called a trash ripper in a lovely manner and uh, let's just get straight to results and take a look at Adobe Premiere 4K video rendering because then there happened something. If we take a look at the result of the second generation third reverse so of the 2990 WX you can see this one took about 14 minutes in Adobe Premiere and wasn't really much faster than an 8 core 9900KS or 9900K from Intel. Now a lot changed. You can see on top of the benchmark chart we have the 3960X 24 core AMD Threadripper. And with a little bit of OC 4.3 GHz, we can even improve this to 7 minutes and 39 seconds. So, extremely impressive how much this Threadripper improved. And this is the real Threadripper now. Like the previous one, I really could not recommend the 2990WX because it had a really bad performance in a lot of benchmarks and in a lot of applications. And now we can see, we can be sure that it was not due to Adobe. I mean, otherwise, the 3960X or the 3970X would also perform worse, but it doesn't. So it was not or it was never Adobe's fault. It was simply the architecture. So the improvement over the 2990WX uh, with going to a centered I.O. die in the middle that's working on the communication between the dies and also the communication of the dies and the, uh, the memory. This architecture of the 3960X is so much better than the previous uh, 2990WX. It's extremely impressive. Before we get to the rest of the CPU benchmarks, we will quickly talk about the TRX40 platform and also about the Aros TRX40 Extreme motherboard, which I used in today's test. The platform itself, probably the best platform I've seen in two or three years. At least there is a real, let's say, innovation going on here because we have eight times PCI Express 4.0 lanes connection between the CPU and the chipset. And that means that, especially on this platform, I don't think we will um, see a bottleneck even using like four M.2 drives, extremely fast ones, maybe in synthetic benchmarks you can get a bottleneck, but like working in workstation applications, I don't think you will see a bottleneck uh, in real world scenarios. So in this regard, extremely nice platform. We have 48 CPU lanes that go directly to the PCI Express slots. So we have two slots that are mechanically uh, 16 and also electrically times 16. And then we have two slots that are mechanically 16 but electrically only times 8 because we have in total 48 uh, CPU lanes but even that I think is absolutely uh, sufficient. So TRX40 in general as a platform really really nice and uh, to talk about the board the main feature I really like about this board is first of all the fact that we have um, 16 true phases for CPU VRM. So there should be no situation where you should encounter problems uh, with the VRM. Quickly talking about some testing results with the CPU on stock one hour of Prime 95. CPU um, VRM hit a maximum of 96 degrees Celsius with zero airflow and with a slight airflow so a, a fan um, pointed towards the VRM in uh, quite some distance. I had 48 degrees Celsius. So that's kind of simulating some airflow in the case. This shows that this cooling solution on this board, because it's a thin heatsink design, is designed for airflow. You need airflow in your case, but if you have the slightest or the smallest amount of airflow, you should have really, really good temperatures uh, on the VRM. Even with OC, the CPU to 4.3 GHz, 1.36 volt, I had with zero airflow 87 degrees Celsius and having some airflow with again a, a fan pointed towards the VRM dropped already to 57 degrees Celsius. So as long as you have any kind of airflow inside your system, you should be absolutely safe with this VRM solution. Talking about the other features of this board, first of all, it's an XL-ATX board. It means that it's not only wider like EATX, but it's also slightly longer. 
Keep this in mind when you select your case. Could be that there are some restrictions that you cannot use every single case out there on the market. As I said before, we have four times M.2, so should be a sufficient amount of M.2 drives for any kind of use case. We have an angled 24 pin connector, which is visually nice but could lead to compatibility issues with some cases so keep that in mind again when you select your case that you also need some space to the side. We have a huge amount of fan connectors also in the area on the top right where the 24 pin ATX connector is located and we also have a ton of RGB headers on the bottom of the board. The only thing I would like to see in future that you're kind of mixing them so you have some RGB and fan connectors in one location, like on the top, and also have some fan and RGB connectors on the bottom, because currently it really depends what kind of case you're using. You have to attach all fan connectors on the top right, all RGB on the bottom. You cannot really mix them, but yeah, if you would mix them, I think it would be a little bit nicer. And then we also have dual 10G LAN server grade on this board with an Intel chip. Uh, you, you also have Wi-Fi if you want to use it, but personally I would uh, stick to the Gen, uh, 10G LAN solution. We also have a ton of Type-C, so this board basically offers everything you would ever ask for. We already talked about Adobe Premiere video rendering performance, so workstation-wise for video rendering, this CPU will work perfectly fine. Let's take a quick look at Cinebench R20, uh, obviously because it's a synthetic benchmark and it scales really, really well with the amount of cores. It was obvious that this CPU would lead the chart. We have over 14,000 points with the CPU overclocked to 4.3 gigahertz so you can get an additional uh, 1,300 points right here with a little bit of OC. Single threaded performance is not much different to like a 3900X or 3700X or 9900KS. There is not much difference between all of those CPUs. Only the 9900KS with 5.2 GHz OC um, is standing out here with the single threaded performance, but otherwise multi-core performance. This CPU is basically destroying everything. Let's talk about some gaming benchmarks with the 3960X previously with the 2990WX. In a lot of games and applications, I really could not recommend this CPU. It really performed not well. But looking at Shadow of the Tomb Raider in 1440p, it's a very impressive result. First, let's take a look at the 3960X stock. It's faster than a 3900X. The average FPS 112 and minimum FPS 93. Now if we overclock the 3960X to 4.G across all cores, it's basically the fastest CPU on average FPS in my test. Minimum FPS it's 96, so the 9900KS in minimum FPS is still better, but I would say there's no difference with the 3960X comparing it to all the other gaming CPUs. So this CPU is absolutely suitable also for gaming. Battlefield 5 1440p is also confirming our previous findings. 3960X stock slightly slower than a 3900X but still absolutely usable for gaming. With a little bit of OC at 4.3 GHz, this CPU is even faster than a 3900X. Still slower than the 9900K but absolutely usable and I don't think you will be able to feel the difference between the 9900K at stock versus the 3960X with OC. One of the reasons why this test took so long is because I performed about 150 to 200 Cinebench runs to get some data about power scaling. So we were taking a look at how does the CPU power scale with frequency, basically having the same core voltage, just increasing CPU frequency, see how this affects the power consumption of the CPU, doing the same also with voltage, so same frequency and then increasing voltage so we can see what kind of influence we have, especially for overclocking. First chart is power consumption versus frequency. In every case we have 1.36 V-core on the CPU while just increasing the CPU frequency. Starting at 300 megahertz on the CPU, on the left about 200 watt power consumption goes up to 4.325 uh, gigahertz on the CPU with about 270 watt power consumption. And it's pretty linear even though doesn't look like it really in a chart, but every 100 megahertz we have an additional 5 to 6 watt power consumption. That's power consumption versus frequency. What is pretty interesting is that power consumption versus vCore, so keeping 4 gigahertz um, on the CPU all time, but increasing the CPU vCore, it's basically the same picture. 
what we can see is increasing the V-core from 1.14 to 1.42 volts starting at about 160 watt power consumption going up to 310 watt power consumption. This is also pretty linear at least this small cut we're looking at obviously if you would start at like 0.5 volt and then going up to 2 volt it would be more a little bit exponential but in this small uh, window we're looking at it's pretty linear again also in this case we have about 5 watt per 10 millivolt now we know that voltage and frequency both have a pretty linear influence on the power consumption but if we overclock a cpu obviously we have both looking at this chart power consumption versus performance you can see that if we add both to the mix so increasing frequency while also increasing vcore it looks pretty exponential starting at 3.9 gigahertz 1.09 volt resulting in 140 watt power consumption and 5700 points in Cinebench R15. If we increase this to 4.4 gigahertz, we're increasing the power consumption to 350 watt at 1.44 volt with a Cinebench score at 6400 points. To translate those numbers, we're increasing the frequency from 4 to 4.4 gigahertz, which is 10%. We're increasing the performance um, in Cinebench by 9.7%. So performance to frequency is pretty linear scaling. That's cool. But power consumption is pretty insane scaling. We're going from 160 to 350 watt power consumption. This is 117%. Basically double the power consumption while you get a plus of 9.7% in performance. Not worth it. Just shows that TSMC 7 nanometers is pretty optimized for around 4 gigahertz and lower voltage 1.2 volt roughly. That's pretty much the sweet spot, but exceeding this spot, it completely escalates. And that's also the reason why we don't really see clocks above 4.3 or 4.4 gigahertz, because this curve is completely escalating at this point. And 4.5 gigahertz would probably be like, I don't know, 450 watt and there is no way you can easily cool it with an octua fan uh, like the one i have here to get decent temperatures at least with like uh, prime 95. i almost forgot about the pch fan on the r6 Extreme motherboard quick word about that because a lot of people are criticizing those fans and i agree on this but on this board um, so far the fan was never working or was never spinning. It probably works, but it was never spinning. Um, the thing is, I tested uh, Crystal Disk Mark to give it some load over the NVMe drive. Also, I was testing PC Mark 10, which is also a little bit more heavy on the M.2 drive. Um, therefore, I was using um, the chipset a little bit more. But the chipset temperature never exceeded 62 degrees Celsius, and the fan was never spinning in any condition. So that's quite cool. And I think um, if you're just using it for normal applications, workstation, whatever, the fan probably won't spin as long as you probably don't use four M.2 drives and crystal disk mark. Let's get to the conclusion, almost. There's unfortunately still one thing we have to talk about. And I'm really sorry that I have to bring this topic up again because the 3960X is pretty much, or probably also 3970X, but it's higher budget, more cores. But the new Threadripper is pretty much perfect platform performs well in any kind of condition no matter if it's gaming if it's workstation load with an extreme amount of cores we have eight lanes between cpu and chipset so no bottleneck there dual 10g lan on the board i mean that's board specific but using this board and cpu combination there's i don't think there's anything i would ask for pretty much perfect except for again the boost clock Gamers Nexus also confirmed this in their review. You can check out their results as well. Cinebench R20 um, one thread test. You can see most of the time. The CPU obviously is not boosting that high and once in a while it's hitting uh, 4475 megahertz, but most of the time it's not boosting that high. And I really don't understand why. Why would you do this? You have, you have like the perfect product. It's like you're winning a quarter mile race and you're setting a new world record with your 10,000 horsepower car that just ran 300 miles per hour. And then you're giving an interview and you're saying, yeah, but it can also run 350 miles per hour. You can never show it. It will never do it. And no one cares because the performance is there. The performance is absolutely there. I mean, you delivered. It's the same with this CPU. You delivered in every single benchmark, no matter if it's gaming, no matter if it's high-end workstation stuff, you absolutely delivered. And it's absolutely unnecessary 
to advertise this CPU with something that's not working. And back then, like 3900X, I could still kind of understand it because you're advertising against, let's say, 9900K. And then you maybe figured out afterwards that in production the CPUs were not as expected. But that was five months ago. And you had five months to kind of work on this issue. And now you're doing the same mistake again. Like, why are you again advertising something you cannot deliver and something that's completely unnecessary? Like, your marketing is ruining your perfectly engineered product. Like, this product is perfect. I would give it, if I would have grades, I would give it 100%. But now I have to deduct like 5%. And it's like 0.1% because the boost is not there. And it's 4.9% because of mismanagement and bad marketing. Um, if you go to the page, it says up to 4.5 gigahertz. And AMD added a disclaimer. I'm not sure if you saw it. Um, but AMD is basically saying that your boost will vary based on several factors, including but not only limited to thermal paste, system cooling, motherboard design, BIOS, latest chipset driver, OS updates. It's the latest Windows, it's the latest chipset driver, it's the latest BIOS on probably the best board you can get. Ours extreme right here. We have 14 faces CPU, so it cannot be the board. Uh, we have Noctua cooler on there which should be fine if you're loading one thread out of 48 threads, right? You're only loading one out of 43, uh, 48, so it cannot be a thermal limit. Um, thermal paste, come on, really. Um, yeah, really unnecessary. And I don't understand why after five months having this debate, you did not just use 4.4. Because then it would be like, oh, you advertised 4.4, but it's hitting 4.75 once in a while. And everybody would be happy. But again, you managed to kind of, you didn't ruin it because it's still a very, very good product, but you added something to it I don't understand. All right, so much about the 3960X, 3970X, really, really good CPUs. I would recommend it to anyone if you're getting it um, for a CPU or for a, a rig that can be for gaming, but also for workstation. It can basically do everything. So yeah, absolutely recommendation from my side. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.